Part 3, Chapter 10. I keep finding things out about myself, and here's what I've discovered so far. I'm rubbish at schoolwork, which I may have mentioned already once or twice. I'm not as clever as Musa Oman, but I've got a lot more common sense than Musa. I'm brilliant at selling things, I may have mentioned that too. I'm quite good looking, or I would be if I could only grow a bit taller, if my nose was smaller. And my ears don't stick out so far. That would help. I don't care about politics, and I never will. I used to think that I was a bit of a coward, but... I know that I'm really actually quite brave. After all, that business with the phone, and no one can say I'm not because I've got a bullet wound to prove it. Hope it leaves a skull. I like living in towns and cities. I'm not a country boy, and I'll never be a farmer. We got out of Dara just in time because the shelling started up again just as we were leaving the city. It'd been a mad rush to get ready in time for seven o'clock in the morning. It's not easy to choose what to take with you and you're about to leave your whole life behind. One bag each, Mara said, as soon as the front doors had closed behind Uncle Faisal. Clothes, shoes, no, Imam. No school books. We'll need warm bedding and pillows, beans, rice and flour. Get to bed now, all of you. You'll have to be up by dawn if you're ready in time. As it happened, Uncle Faisal was late. Traffic, he panted, as he came in through the door. There are hardly any cars, but everyone's gone back to using their old carts with horses and donkeys and even camels. And thousands of people are just walking. The whole city's on the move. Are you ready? We've got to go now. They say the shelling's going to get bad again today. His anxiety was like an infection. I hurtled up and down the stairs, carrying stuff out of the van and then rushing up to the flat again, without even thinking or feeling tired. I saw Aman and Musa whispering together as we left the flat for the first time and noticed how heavy Aman's bag seemed to be. Books, I thought with disgust. I was only too pleased at the thought of leaving schoolwork behind. The back of Uncle Faisal's van had looked quite roomy, but by the time we packed it full of blankets and rugs and cushions and bundles of clothes and bags of food, there wasn't much room for us passengers. We piled in somehow, all crammed in like pickles in a jar. It was horribly stuffy, and at first there were long waits as Uncle Faisal sat fuming in the traffic jams. Once we were out of town, I saw what he'd meant about the van's strings. It didn't seem to me that it had any. We were shaken about so much that we all started looking green. When at last the van stopped and we tumbled out onto the stony path that led up to the little courtyard outside Uncle Mahomes' farmhouse, as if we'd arrived in another world. It was still only in the middle of the morning and the sun was rather warm, but not too hot. It wasn't even the beginning of springtime, but everything looked green and fresh and sort of washed and sparkling, quite different from the dirt and dust and rubble of Zara. Alhamdulillah, thank God, Ma said beaming at Uncle Faisal as he opened the doors of the van and let us out. You've saved us, my brother. How can we ever thank you? Listen, what was that? Baba said sharply. Boom! Boom! We scrambled up the van and turned to look back along the way we'd come. Dara was more than 30 kilometres away, beyond the horizon now, but we all knew what that sound meant. The shelling had started again. The noises. The noise itself was just rolling all the way across the innocent fields and up to the quiet village on the rise behind the farmhouse. I could almost imagine what it looked like. A nasty, grey, miserable, choking cloud of horror. Nobody moved. Then up by the har- farmhouse, the guard dog began barking and Nadia had slept right through the journey. Wake up, looked round and started grizzling. A man had been holding her, but Ma took over and started rocking her up and down. Moose was still staring in the direction of Dara. He was frowning so hard his thick black eyebrows met across the top of his nose. I knew he was thinking of Basem and the others, and perhaps even wishing he was there with them. Granny was standing behind Musa. She was clutching a large photograph of Grandfather in a glass-fronted frame and was leaning against Baba, who was holding her up with one arm. She looked smaller somehow, as if she'd shrunk in the wash. The door of the farmhouse creaked open. There was a shriek as Auntie Fuzza caught up sight of us. She came running down the path, the edges of her black hijab fledging, clapping out. Alan, wa salam, you are welcome, come, come in. Behind her, I could see her two little girls, my cousins, Yasmin and Fatima, peering shyly out from the doorway. As she reached us, another boom from Dara made her stop and squeal with fright. All day yesterday it was going on. I said to Abu Jabba, Layla and her family, how are they? Inshallah, they are still alive. We must send them a message. Tell them to come. And now here you are. How can I live if my family is in danger? Ma threw Nadia over her shoulder and turned to Auntie Fazia. She opened her mouth to say something, but Auntie Fazia had pulled her into a hug, talking all the time. My poor sister, bring all your things. 
There's always room for you. Even if our house is small, this is your own home. She took Ma by the arm and led her towards the courtyard, shouting at the dog. I'd never had much to do with dogs and I was a bit worried about the way it was draining on its rope, showing a couple of rows of sharp-looking teeth. But it shut up at once and sank back. It kept a close eye on us, though, and I decided I'd keep well away. Auntie Fazia was still talking non-stop as Uncle Faisal unloaded our things from the back of the van. Omar, Musa, help your uncle. Baba called out to us. Faisal, you'll stop for tea. Uncle Faisal looked anxiously at his watch. No time. My parents' place is on the other side of the hour. There'll be roadblocks everywhere by now. Of course, Baba nodded. I can't tell you how grateful I am. <clears throat> Uncle Faisal cut him off with a wave of his hand. Your Majesty's brother, we're fond of you all. He dropped the last bundle into my arms and slammed the van's back doors. He climbed into the driving seat, then leaned out the window, looking embarrassed. Sorry about your mother, Hamid. Maja just had enough. She says it's your turn now. All the best. A moment later, the van was rattling away. Footsteps crunched behind us. I turned to see Uncle Mahmood, coming round the side of the farmhouse. He smiled warmly when he saw us. Uncle Mahmood's face was brown and leathery from working outdoors in the sun. He was in his working clothes, a long grey tunic, hitched up with a belt to keep his legs free, and a red kefir wrapped around his head. Unlike Auntie Fazia, Uncle Mahmood never said a word more than necessary. Just as well, I suppose. My cousin Jabba had followed him. I nodded at him and tried out a smile. He nodded back, stony-faced. He'd just turned 15, so he was a year older than me, and every time we met, we'd circled round each other like a pair of hostile dogs. Uncle Mahmood jerked his chin towards the old building with a curved stone roof that stood at right angles to the farmhouse. Jabba bent to scoop up a bundle of our blankets. I grabbed another load and Musa picked up a couple of cushions and tucked them under his good arm. Can he walk that far, Jabba said to me. Why don't you ask him, I replied shortly. Musa flashed a smile at Jabba and pointed to the satellite dish on the flat roof of the farmhouse. You got broadband, he said, as clearly as he could. Jabba looked doubtful. We got TV, if that's what you mean. He seemed uncomfortable talking to Musa and turned back to me. There's a mobile phone mast in the village, but it doesn't always work. The electricity's off here anyway. They cut it off a few weeks ago. Musa's face fell. Jabba didn't notice. He kept his eyes on me. We've got a generator, he said proudly. Don't use it much in case that oil runs out. It's for the farm stuff. Musa's eyes brightened again. A, a, a generator? That's wonderful. Jabba ignored him. When you pull an elastic band until it's tight and then tweak it, it makes a twanging noise. But when you let it go, it sags and it doesn't make a sound at all. Those first days in the village, I felt as if an elastic band tying up my insides had been let go. And now, I was all floppy and quiet. It was hard to get used to not being scared all the time. Not having your nerves vibrating like guitar strings at every unexpected sound. Baba only stayed a couple of nights. He insisted on going back to Dara, even though Ma begged him not to. A colleague had offered to put him up. He said, in a quiet town, away from the fighting. He needed to show up at the ministry every day, even if the offices were closed. If he was to make sure that his salary would go on being paid. Auntie Fazia had been right about the farmhouse being small. We could have packed in there if we wanted to, but she and Uncle Mahmood had a better idea. The old stone building at the side of the courtyard had been the main farmhouse long ago but it was a storeroom now. It was quite long and narrow, just one room with a curved roof, no windows and a heavy wooden door at one end. I realised that Auntie Fazia must have been expecting us for days because she and Uncle Mahmood had cleared the storeroom out to make a space for us. There were still stacks of stuff and bottles and jars at the fire end and you could tell that the donkey had lived in it by the smell and the wisps of straw that hadn't quite managed to clear up off the beaten fur. Your grandfather was born in this house, Ma said, looking round fondly at the stone walls. We used to stay in here when I was a little girl. Our families lived in it for hundreds of years. That's all very well, I'd wanted to say, but it's pokey and stuffy and I'd die if anyone from school saw me in here. However, I kept that to myself. The storeroom had looked like a miserable kind of place at first, but by the time we'd given it another good sweeping, a ma and a ma had strung up a cloth across the middle to make a kind of bedroom at the far end for the two of them, as well as Granny and Nadia. It wasn't actually that bad. In the front section, closest to the door, Ma arranged rugs on the floor and cushions around the walls to make a sitting room and a place for us boys to sleep. She shared the cooking for everyone with Auntie Fazia in the farmhouse kitchen and didn't seem to mind having her ear bent all day long as Auntie Fazia talked on and on. 
Ma and Auntie Fazio and Aman had spent ages washing all our clothes with water from the farm's well, getting the mumps of dirt and dust out of them. It really cheered me up to put on a clean shirt and trousers, and after scrubbing myself from head to toe and shampooing my hair, I finally felt as if I could respect myself again. The village school didn't take boys beyond the age of 12, so only Floyd could go. With no school, I'd thought I'd have an easy time of it, but I realised almost at once that I'd got that very wrong. You mustn't make use of Omar on the farm, I overheard Baba say, as he set off back to Dara. Great, Baba, I thought. Ask me first, perhaps. Thank you, Amid, Uncle Mimi replied. I did have a farm hand, but he went back to Egypt last year. I'd be glad of the help. It was a long speech for him. Jabba was standing nearby and he shot me a look of triumph. My heart sank. Jabba had only done three or four years at school and I knew he was a bit shaky with reading and writing, but he'd run rings round me on the farm and he'd enjoy it too. Uncle Mahmood let me have a couple of days to settle in and then it was the end of the week and we all had to go off to Friday prayers. I'd never liked the mosque in Dara, but this little village mosque was much worse. The carpets were dusty and the water pipes red with rust. The Iman was ancient and all he seemed to talk about was sin and how Allah would punish us if he did the wrong things. It was embarrassing the way everyone stared at us too and talked about Musa as if he wasn't there. By Saturday evening I was getting bored and was actually quite looking forward to doing a bit of work on the farm. It wasn't much fun being with Musa and Iman anyway and I stayed out of Jabba's way as much as I could. Iman seemed to have shrunk back into himself. In Dara she'd managed to keep on with her schoolwork but now that we were in the village her education was over. She didn't even open the book she smuggled into her bag. When she wasn't in the kitchen or looking after the children, she spent hours unravelling an old sweater of mooses and knitting it up again for Floyd. She was horribly moody and bit my head off if I just tried to talk to her. I'll be on your side, I'd said to her all these months ago in Bosra. I'll make sure you get to college. There was no chance that I could now keep that promise. So I just kept out of her way. Musa was lousy company too. He had nothing to do except fiddle on his mobile phone, trying to get through to his friends and Dara. And when he couldn't, which was most of the time, he was in a really foul temper. Uncle Mahmood had told me to be ready early on Saturday morning to start work, and I was waiting when he came to call me, feeling keen and eager to do my best. Jabba was standing behind his father as I came out of our storeroom house, looking sulky and holding the donkey on a rope. Uncle Mahmood, who worked on building sites when he wasn't needed on the farm, slapped us both on the shoulder, then turned and hurried off into the village where I could hear a minibus revving its engine, telling everyone it was about to go. What are we supposed to be doing then? I asked Jabba, looking nervously at the donkey. It tried to kick me a couple of times, and I didn't like going too near its teeth either. You'll see, was all Jabba said. He started off quickly with the donkey behind him. There was a large basket slung against each of its sides, and they bounced as it trotted along. I had to hurry to keep up. The field we were going to work in was down at the bottom of the slope below the farmhouse, beyond a fringe of olive trees. Uncle Mahmood had ploughed it, at the week before. The plough had turned up lots of white stones as well, some as big as melons. We've got to pick all them stones up, Jabba said, and pile them on the edge of the field. I stared at him. You've got to be joking. There are millions of them. It'll take forever. So, we're not posh enough for you, is that it? He said, flushing. Welcome to the real world, silly boy. No, I mean... It's fine, I said, bending to pick up a stone. Jabba had already scooped up three or four and dropped them into one of the donkey's baskets. I can't believe how slowly time passed that morning. I dropped stones on my field and yelped with pain. I broke my fingernails and I bruised my hands. After half an hour, bending over, lifting and heaving, my back was aching and my arms felt as if they were strained all the way to my shoulders. I was determined not to look weak in front of Jabba, but I could see he despised me for being so feeble. He kept teasing me too. Scorpion, scorpion, he shouted and fling something at me, making me jump with fright. I flinched and fell a couple of times before I learned to just ignore him.